friends, welcome back. I'm Christina, the manager at the Pacific Beach Library. Thank you for joining me for day 17 of our read along together of Roughing It by Mark Twain. And actually there are now more titles that you can choose from, yay! We have three votes, that are three dominated titles last I checked. And so if you want to read something else beyond what's on there, go ahead and nominate something else. But for right now, the titles that are available for you to vote on are Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, Persuasion by Jane Austen, and also A New um, Horse in the Race, Anna Karenina by Leo, Sto Leo Tolstoy. Sorry. Um, let's see. So let's start with tea. I'm excited about today's tea. I'm always excited about the teas, aren't I? Yeah, some days I think there's got to be a tea that's like mm, a little iffy on, but this one is beautiful. So Oh, okay, I want to show you what it looks like also. So again, I went to a tea workshop last Saturday. And when I say went to, I attended it at my dining room <laughs> virtually. <laughs> but um, the tea, the third tea in the series that we went through and did the tasting on was called a Golden Dawn Oolong. So it's a Chinese tea. Oh, it got a little wet. Sorry about that. Uh, it's, a Chinese, it's a Chinese tea and it says... Um, this tea produces a cup that is extremely aromatic. The liquor is sweet floral, think lilacs, and silky with a tiny bit of a mineral edge. And it says it's just made of oolong tea. Hello! Um, and so with this one, I thought was especially neat. I'm gonna turn around so you can see it. I don't know if you can see that very well. Basically, the way the gentleman described it was that, let me get, pull one of these out, is that the tea, which as I previously mentioned to you, he said all the tea is basically, um, it looks like, two leaves boop, and then um, in between the two leaves there's like a little bud that grows up and so what they do with this particular style of tea hello is they actually as it is drying they kind of roll it into a little ball so uh, I'm not sure if there's a great way for me to show this to you I'm sorry it looks like a little ball and so as the tea leaves open up as they steep let me just show you the little basket that I pulled out of there they really open up wide. And so that little tiny ball, that was just one sample of the balls, they become these huge leaves. And so let me just pull one out. You can see like this very large leaf that unfurls itself. And what the gentleman was saying, but you can see some of them are still a bit crinkled. And because of that, what he was recommending is that, oh yeah, that one's actually still attached. So you can see the two leaves and there's just a tiny little bud right in the middle there. And so this is a great example of one. And you can see how it's still wrinkled. The leaf isn't completely opened up. Because of that, because of the um, the way that the leaf is rolled up as it dries, that as you're, um, the first time you steep it, you'll open it up and get that flavor of the tea. But some of the leaves, like that last one that I showed you, still are crinkled up. And so you haven't fully opened and unfurled the leaf. And so he does highly recommend steeping it multiple times. And he was saying you'll get a different flavor from it each time. It's not just that it's a weaker flavor because you've already brewed it before, but you're getting some like a little bit of fresh pops here and there of like the leaves that had been crushed together that were still rolled up, that as they're opening, you're releasing more of the flavor of the tea. So fun stuff. Um, like I was saying, so this one um, he did recommend as you re-steep, put it in for a longer time, use a cooler water. He also said that um, oolong teas are partially oxidized, which is why they have a little bit of a darker color than like a white tea or even a green tea sometimes, but not as dark as a black tea or the dark teas, Oops, which we'll try tomorrow. Mm. So oolong is kind of like, yeah, in, it's, sort, it's a green, it's a sort of more the green family of tea, it seems like, but yeah. It's a fun tea, that's a nice one. But it just I just thought it was so cool too how it goes from this tiny little ball of tea to just opening up to these beautiful, beautiful leaves. It was also saying too, when you re-steep, if you wanna add in a little bit more of the fresh, like not the full, um, it's basically about a teaspoon for each cup of tea that you're brewing. Um, my pot does about 24 ounces, so um, I usually put it in a good size tablespoon. So you know, you might wanna add a tiny bit extra to kind of punch it up a little bit if you're re-steeping on your second or third steeping for the leaves. But um, yeah, just a fun little tidbit about the tea. All right, now let's talk about our reading because it's the tea with Mark Twain. Tea with, um, you're, you're here for tea, but also probably a bit more about the book, let's be honest. <laughs> I'm also here for the tea. Um, 
<laughs> so let's talk a bit about what we read yesterday in Roughing It by Mark Twain, and then we'll go to our new chapters for today. So yesterday we read three chapters together. In chapter 55, Mark Twain spoke about how basically he had realized he was a bit um, feeling like he was ready for a change. And so he decided to take a friend up on his offer to um, represent a mining company that wanted to go to New York to sell rights into their mine. And so his friend tells him about this opportunity and so he decides to go. Um, a bit more stuff too about like some folks he meets on the carriage. What's weird to me too is that he decides he's gonna go to New York to try to sell rights to this mine, but for some reason instead of going back across the way he came, like traveling east, he decides to go to San Francisco, and I'm not sure if he's gonna catch a boat or if he's gonna catch a train or exactly how he's getting across to New York, but somehow, and maybe I missed it, if anyone else caught this part, in order to go to New York, he's traveling to San Francisco. Um, it all works out. Um, so he ends up going to San Francisco and on the way he, so then chapter 56 is talking about like, you know, what it looks like in California, how, you know, it's really so beautiful, but it's good to see from a distance and how these, you know, people praise the weather, but for him personally, he thinks that having the same beautiful weather all the time by virtue of it being the same is not pleasant, that you need change, that you need the seasons. So again, as a Southern Californian born and bred, I gotta say, I do love a lit up palm tree for Christmas and I like to have my weather almost the same all year round. Um, but for Mark Twain, that is not the idea of good weather, that it becomes almost taxing, that it's, it's depressing to not have enough change and that you need the variation in order to have the feeling of seasons. And so for him, um, he was saying it's much better to head back to the East Coast and get that kind of seasonal weather. So let's see, he talks a bit more about like the, what the weather's like. He talks a bit about San Francisco and Sacramento. And you know, he tells a bit about old California and that's actually really fun. He says too, how like it's such a um, masculine area um, that basically it's these men from back East who decided they needed adventure, who wanted to venture out into trying something new, to dare to become a miner and to, to, to be like these, people who would take a risk, that those were the ones who went west first. And so by virtue of that, you had this society that was building up. It wasn't just a normal mix of people. It was your most adventurous people, your, mo your bravest people, your strongest people. And so he was saying, it was interesting too, he brings up also that these men, where are they now so many years later, scattered to the ends of the earth, prematurely aged and decrepit, shot or stabbed or dead of disappointed hopes and broken dreams. Oh gosh, so depressing. It's pitiful to think about it, he says. But these men, while they were there, it was rough times, it was busy times, and um, <laughs> it is just that, he was just saying that typified California, this, this adventurous spirit, um, and that, also being so filled with men that it was so exciting to see a woman, any woman. And he tells these two stories about how like one, one person came west to go work the mines and that, you know, he was saying like, you know, his wife was with him, but she was sick. They were robbed. They had nothing. And the other men are just, please just bring your wife out of the, out of the wagon. We want to see her. And he brings her out and the other men are so excited just to, at the sight of being able to see a woman that they give this man all this money um, between them um, all, they collect $2,500 in gold and they give it to the man because they're just so happy to have finally been able to see a woman again after all that time. Um, he tells, Mark Twain tells a story too of a woman from San Francisco who says that when she and her family came west that um, they had their little girl with her and just a, let's see, a little girl, was she just a year and a half, or two years, two or three years old at the time? And they're saying that, you know, this miner saw the little girl and was just so flabbergasted to see a child and a girl child at that. And he's like, oh my goodness. And he takes a little sack out of his pocket and says, here's $150 in gold dust. Please, will you let me kiss the child? Because it'd been so long since he'd seen a child. And so, and Mark Twain, of course, says this anecdote is true. Italics and emphasis on the true, which makes me wonder how true some of the other stuff is. Also true, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Mark Twain then follows so this something up, which we, he does not say as emphatically say was true, which was an anecdote about how once um, he was in the Humboldt Mountains 
and he saw a line of miners waiting to look at something. And so he got in line too, you know, they, and they finds out it's a line to see a genuine live woman. And at the end of a half hour wait, he gets to see a, the woman. And it's a very elderly woman whom he originally describes as 165 years old of a day. And uh, she with no teeth and just frying flapjacks in her pan. And, but again, these men had all lined up for the opportunity to see a woman because it was just such a rare sight during those times in the Wild West. So, <laughs> That's our, that was our chapters from yesterday. Today, we are going to read 58 to 61. And I will say, as I was skimming around, I did see the word Calaveras. So I don't know if we're going to hear about any jumping frogs of Calaveras County today, but maybe we're getting to the, the section of his history where that, that perhaps inspired that story. Let's go in together and start out with chapter 58 of Roughing It by Mark Twain. As I mentioned, we're going to read four chapters today, 58 to 61. Let's begin with chapter 58. For a few months, I enjoyed what to me was an entirely new phase of existence, a butterfly idleness, nothing to do, nobody to be responsible to, and untroubled with financial easiness. I fell in love with the most cordial and sociable city in the Union. After the sagebrush and alkali deserts of Washoe, San Francisco was paradise to me. I lived at the best hotel, exhibited my clothes in the most conspicuous places, infested the opera, and learned to seem enraptured with music, which oftener afflicted my ignorant ear than enchanted it, if I had had the vulgar honesty to confess it. However, I suppose I was not greatly worse than the most of my countrymen in that. I had longed to be a butterfly, and I was one at last. I attended private parties in sumptuous evening dress, simpered and aired my graces like a born beau, and poked and shot, shottest, Scottish? with a step peculiar to myself and the kangaroo. In a word, I kept the due state of a man worth $100,000, prospectively, and likely to reach absolute affluence when that silver mine sale should be ultimately achieved in the East. I spent money with a free hand and meantime watched the stock sales with an interested eye and looked to see what might happen in Nevada. Something very important happened. The property holders of Nevada voted against the state constitution, but the folks who had nothing to lose were in the majority and carried the measure over their heads. But after all, it did not immediately look like a disaster, although unquestionably it was one. I hesitated, calculated the chances, and then concluded not to sell. Stocks went on rising, Specu speculation went mad. Bankers, merchants, lawyers, doctors, mechanics, laborers, even the very washerwomen and servant girls were putting up their earnings on silver stocks, and every sun that rose in the morning went down on paupers enriched and rich men beggared. What a gambling carnival it was. Gold and curry soared to $6,300 a foot. And then, all of a sudden, out went the bottom, and everything and everybody went to ruin and destruction. The wreck was complete. The bubble scarcely left a microscopic moisture behind it. I was an early beggar and a thorough one. My hoarded stocks were not worth the paper they were printed on. I threw them all away. I, the cheerful idiot that had been squandering money like water and thought myself beyond the reach of misfortune, had not now as much as $50 when I gathered together my various debts and paid them. I removed from the hotel to a very private boarding house. I took a reporter's berth and went to work. I was not entirely broken in spirit, for I was building confidently on the sale of the silver mine in the east. But I could not hear from Dan. My letters miscarried or were not answered. One day I did not feel vigorous and remained away from the office. The next day I went down toward noon as usual and found a note on my desk which had been there 24 hours. It was signed, Marshall, the Virginia reporter and contained a request that I should call at the hotel and see him and a friend or two that night as they would sail for the east in the morning. A postscript added that their errand was a big mining speculation. I was hardly ever so sick in my life. I abused myself for leaving Virginia and entrusting to another man a matter I ought to have attended to myself. I abused myself for remaining away from the office on the one day of all the year that I should have been there. And thus berating myself, I trotted a mile to the steamer wharf and arrived just in time to be too late. The ship was in the stream and underway. Hmm. I comforted myself with the thought that may, 
that maybe the speculation would amount to nothing, poor comfort at best, and then went back to my slavery, resolved to put up with my $35 a week and forget all about it. A month afterward, I enjoyed my first earthquake. It was one which was long called the Great Earthquake and is doubtless so distinguished till this day. It was just after noon on a bright October day. I was coming down Third Street. The only objects in motion anywhere in sight in that thickly built and populous quarter were a man in a buggy behind me and a streetcar wending slowly up the cross street. Otherwise, all was solitude and a Sabbath stillness. As I turned the corner around a frame house, there was a great rattle and jar, and it occurred to me that here was an item, no doubt a fight in that house. Before I could turn and seek the door, there came a really terrific shock. The ground seemed to roll under me in waves, interrupted by a violent joggling up and down, and there was a heavy grinding noise as of brick houses rubbing together. I fell up against the frame house and hurt my elbow. I knew what it was now, and from mere repertorial instinct, nothing else, took out my watch and noted the time of day. At that moment, a third and still severer shock came, and as I reeled about on the pavement trying to keep my footing, I saw a sight. The entire front of a tall four-story brick building in Third Street sprung outward like a door and fell sprawling across the street, raising a dust like a great volume of smoke. And here came the buggy, Overboard went the man, and in less time than I can tell it, the vehicle was distributed in small fragments along 300 yards of street. One could have fancied that somebody had fired a charge of chair rounds and rags down the thoroughfare. The streetcar had stopped, the horses were rearing and plunging, the passengers were pouring out at both ends, and one fat man had crashed halfway through a glass window on one side of the car, got wedged fast, and was squirming and screaming like an impaled madman. Every door of every house, as far as the eye could reach, was vomiting a stream of human beings. And almost before one could execute a wink and begin another, there was a massed multitude of people stretching in endless procession down every street my position commanded. Never was solemn solitude, excuse me, never was solemn solitude turned into teeming life quicker. Of the wonders wrought by the great earthquake, these were all that came under my eye. But the tricks it did elsewhere and far and wide over the town made toothsome gossip for nine days. The destruction of property was trifling. The injury to it was widespread and somewhat serious. The curiosities of the earthquake were simply endless. Gentlemen and ladies who were sick or were taking a siesta or had dissipated till a late hour and were making up lost sleep thronged into the public streets in all sorts of queer apparel and some without any at all. One woman who had been washing a naked child ran down the street, holding it by the ankles as if it were a dressed turkey. Prominent citizens who were supposed to keep the Sabbath strictly rushed out of saloons in their shirt sleeves with billiard, billiard cues in their hand. Dozens of men with necks swathed in napkins rushed from barber shops, lathered to the eyes or with one cheek clean shaved and the other still bearing a hairy stubble. Horses broke from stables and a frightened dog rushed up a short attic ladder and out onto a roof and when his scare was over had not the nerve to go down again the same way he had gone up. A prominent editor flew downstairs in the principal hotel with nothing on but one brief undergarment, met a chambermaid and exclaimed, oh, what shall I do? Where shall I go? She responded with a naive serenity, if you have no choice, you might try a clothing store. A certain foreign consul's lady was the acknowledged leader of fashion, and every time she appeared in anything new or extraordinary, the ladies in the vicinity made a raid on their husbands' purses and arrayed themselves similarly. One man who had suffered considerably and growled accordingly was standing at the window when the shocks came, and the next instant the consul's wife, just out of the bath, fled by with no other apology for clothing than a bath towel. The sufferer rose superior to the terrors of the earthquake and said to his wife, now that is something like, get out your towel, my dear. <laughs> the plastering that fell from ceilings in San Francisco that day would have covered several acres of ground. 
For some days afterward, groups of eyeing and pointing men stood about many a building, looking at long zigzag cracks that extended from the eaves to the ground. Four feet of the tops of three chimneys on one house were broken square off and turned around in such a way as to completely stop the draft. A crack a hundred feet long gaped open six inches wide in the middle of one street and then shut together again with such force as to ridge up the meeting earth like a slender grave. A lady sitting in her rocking and quaking parlor saw the wall part at the ceiling, open and shut twice, like a mouth, and then drop and, and then drop the end of a brick on the floor like a tooth. She was a woman easily disgusted with foolishness, and she arose and went out of there. One lady who was coming downstairs was astonished to see a bronze Hercules lean forward on its pedestal as if to strike her with its club. They both reached the bottom of the flight at the same time, the woman insensible from the fright. Her child, born some little time afterward, was club-footed. <laughs> However, on second thought, if the reader sees any coincidence in this, he must do it at his own risk. The first shock brought down two or three huge organ pipes in one of the churches. The minister with uplifted hands was just closing the services. He glanced up, hesitated, and said, However, we will omit the benediction. And the next instant, there was a vacancy in the atmosphere where he had stood. After the first shock, an Oakland minister said, Keep your seats. There is no better place to die than this. And added after the third, But outside is good enough. He then skipped out at the back door. <laughs> Such another destruction of mantle ornaments and toilette bottles as the earthquake created, San Francisco never saw before. There was hardly a girl or a matron in the city but suffered losses of this kind. Suspended pictures were thrown down, but oftener still, by a curious freak of the earthquake's humor, they were whirled completely around with their faces to the wall. There was great difference of opinion at first as to the course or direction the earthquake traveled, but water that splashed out of various tanks and buckets settled that. Thousands of people were made so seasick by the rolling and pitching of floors and streets that they were weak and bedridden for hours, and some few for even days afterward. Hardly an individual escaped nausea entirely. The Queer Earthquake. Episodes that formed the staple of San Francisco gossip for the next week would fill a much larger book than this, and so I will, and so I will diverge from the subject. By and by, in the due course of things, I picked up a copy of the Enterprise one day and fell under this cruel blow. Nevada Mines in New York. G. M. Marshall, Sheba Hers, and Amos H. Rose, who left San Francisco last July for New York City with ores from mines in Pinewood District, Humboldt County, and on the Reese River Range, have disposed of a mine, of a mine containing 6,000 feet and called the Pine Mountains Consolidated for the sum of three million dollars. The stamps on the deed, which is now on its way to Humboldt County from New York for record, amounted to three thousand dollars, which is said to be the largest amount of stamps ever placed on one document. A working capital of one million dollars has been paid into the treasury and machinery has already been purchased for a large quartz mill, which will be put up as soon as possible. The stock in this company is all full paid and entirely unaccessible. The ores of the mines in this district somewhat resemble those of the Sheba mine in Humboldt. Sheba Hurst, the discoverer of the mines, with his friends corralled all the best leads and all the land and timber they desired before making public their whereabouts. Ores from there, assayed in this city, showed them to be exceedingly rich in silver and gold, silver predominating. There is an abundance of wood and water in the district. We are glad to know that New York capital has been enlisted in the development of the mines of this region. Having seen the ores and assays, we are satisfied that the mines of the district are very valuable, anything but wildcat. Once more, native imbecility had carried the day, and I had lost a million. It was the blind lead all over again. <sighs> Let us not dwell on this miserable matter. If I were inventing these things, I could be wonderfully humorous over them, but they are too true to be talked of with hearty levity, even at this distant day. Here's a footnote. True, and yet not exactly as given in the above figures, possibly. I saw Marshall months afterward, and although he had plenty of money, he did not claim to have captured an entire million. In fact, I gathered that he had not then received $50,000. 
Beyond that figure, his fortune appeared to consist of uncertain vast expectations rather than prodigious certainties. However, when the above item appeared in print, I put full faith in it and incontinently wilted and went to seed under it. Suffice it that I so lost heart and so yielded myself up to repinings and sighings and foolish regrets that I neglected my duties and became about worthless as a reporter for a brisk newspaper. And at last, one of the proprietors took me aside with a charity I still remember with considerable respect and gave me an opportunity to resign my birth and so save myself the disgrace of a dismissal. And now chapter 59. For a time, I wrote literary screeds for the golden era. C.H. Webb had established a very excellent literary weekly called The Californian, but high merit was no guarantee of success. It languished, and he sold out to three printers, and Bret Hart became editor at $20 a week, and I was employed to contribute an article a week at $12. But the journal still languished, and the printers sold out to Captain Ogden, a rich man and a pleasant gentleman who chose to amuse himself with such an expensive luxury without much caring about the cost of it. When he grew tired of the novelty, he resold to the printers. The paper presently died a peaceful death, and I was out of work again. I would not mention these things but for the fact that they so aptly illustrate the ups and downs that characterize life on the Pacific coast. A man could hardly stumble into such a variety of queer vicissitudes in any other country. For two months, my sole occupation was avoiding acquaintances, for during that time, I did not earn a penny or buy an article of any kind or pay my board. I became a very, I became a very adept at slinking. I slunk from back street to back street, I slunk away from approaching faces that, look, that looked familiar. I slunk to my meals, ate them humbly and with a mute apology for every mouthful I robbed my generous landlady of. And at midnight, after wanderings that were but slinkings away from cheerfulness and light, I slunk to my bed. I felt meaner and lowlier and more despicable than the worms. During all this time, I had but one piece of money, a silver 10 cent piece, and I held to it and would not spend it on any account lest the consciousness coming strong upon me that I was entirely penniless might suggest suicide. I had pawned everything but the clothes I had on, so I clung to my dime desperately till it was smooth from handling. However, I am forgetting. I did have one other occupation besides that of slinking. It was the entertaining of a collector and being entertained by him, who had his hands, excuse me, who had in his hands the Virginia banker's bill for the $46 which I had loaned my schoolmate, the prodigal. This man used to call regularly once a week and dun me, and sometimes oftener. He did it from sheer force of habit, for he knew he could get nothing. He would get out his bill, calculate the interest for me at 5% a month, and show me clearly that there was no attempt at fraud in it and no mistakes, and then plead, and argue, and done with all his might for any sum, any little trifle, even a dollar, even half a dollar on account. Then his duty was accomplished and his conscience free. He immediately dropped the subject as he immediately dropped the subject there always, got out a couple of cigars and divided, put his feet in the window, and then we would have a long, luxurious talk about everything and everybody, and he would furnish me a world of curious dunning adventures out of the ample store in his memory. By and by, he would clap his hat on his head, shake hands, and say briskly, Well, business is business. Can't stay with you always. And was off in a second. The idea of pining for a dun. And yet, I used to long for him to come, and would get as uneasy as any mother if the day went by without his visit when I was expecting him. But he never collected that bill. At last, nor any part of it. I lived to pay it to the banker myself. Misery loves company. Now and then at night, in out-of-the-way, dimly lighted places, I found myself happening on another child of misfortune. He looked so seedy and forlorn, so homeless and friendless and forsaken, that I yearned toward him as a brother. I wanted to claim kinship with him and go about and enjoy our wretchedness together. The drawing toward each other must have been mutual. At any rate, we got to falling together oftener, though still seemingly by accident. And although we did not speak or evince any recognition, I think the dull anxiety passed out of both of us when we saw each other. And then for several hours, we would idle along contentedly, wide apart and glancing furtively in at home lights and fireside gatherings out of the night shadows 
and very much enjoying our dumb companionship. Finally, we spoke and were inseparable after that, for our woes were identical almost. He had been a reporter too and lost his birth, and this was his experience as nearly as I can recollect it. After losing his birth, he had gone down, down, down with never a halt, from a boarding house on Russian Hill to a boarding house in Kearney Street, from thence to DuPont, from thence to a low sailor den, and from thence to lodgings in goods boxes and empty hogsheads near the wharves. Then for a while he had gained a meager living by sewing up bursted sacks of grain on the piers. When that failed, he had found food here and there as chance threw it in his way. He had ceased to show his face in daylight now, for, re for a reporter knows everybody, rich and poor, high and low, and cannot well avoid familiar faces in the broad light of day. This mendicant blucher, I call him that for convenience, was a splendid creature. He was full of hope, pluck, and philosophy. He was well-read and a man of cultivated taste. He had a bright wit and was a master of satire. His kindliness and his generous spirit made him royal in my eyes and changed his curbstone seat to a throne and his damaged hat to a crown. He had an adventure once which sticks fast in my memory as the most pleasantly grotesque that ever touched my sympathies. He had been without a penny for two months. He had shirked about obscure streets among friendly dim lights till the thing had become second nature to him. But at last he was driven abroad in daylight. The cause was sufficient. He had not tasted food for 48 hours and he could not endure the misery of his hunger in idle hiding. He came along a back street, glowering at the loaves and bake shop windows and feeling that he could trade his life away for a morsel to eat. The sight of the bread doubled his hunger but it was good to look at anyhow and imagine what one might do if one only had it. Presently, in the middle of the street, he saw a shining spot, looked again, did not and could not believe his eyes, turned away to try them, then looked again. It was a verity. No vain hunger inspired, inspired, no vain hunger inspired delusion. It was a silver dime. He snatched it gloated over it, doubted it, bit it, found it genuine, choked his heart down and smothered a hallelujah. Then he looked around, saw that nobody was looking at him, threw the dime down where it was before, walked away a few steps and approached again, pretending he did not know it was there so that he could re-enjoy the luxury of finding it. He walked around it, viewing it from different points, then sauntered about with his hands in his pockets, looking up at the signs and now and then glancing at it and feeling the old thrill again. Finally, he took it up and went away, fondling it in his pocket. He idled through unfrequented streets, stopping in doorways and corners to take it out and look at it. By and by, he went home to his lodgings, an empty Queensware hogshead, and employed himself till night trying to make up his mind what to buy with it but it was hard to do. To get the most for it was the idea. He knew that at the miner's restaurant, he could get a plate of beans and a plate of bread for 10 cents or a fish ball and, a, and some few trifles, but they gave no bread with one fish ball there. At French Pete's, he could get a veal cutlet, plain, and some radishes and bread for 10 cents or a cup of coffee, a pint at least, and a slice of, and a slice of bread. But the slice was not thick enough by the eighth of an inch, and sometimes there were still more criminal than that in the cutting of it. At seven o'clock, his hunger was wolfish, and still his mind was not made up. He turned out and went up Merchant Street, still ciphering and chewing a bit of stick, as is the way of starving men. He passed before the lights of Martin's restaurant, the most aristocratic in the city, and stopped. It was a place where he had often dined in better days, and Martin knew him well. Standing aside, just out of the range of the light, he worshipped the quails and stakes in the show window and imagined that maybe the fairy times were not gone yet and some prince in disguise would come along presently and tell him to go in there and take whatever he wanted. He chewed his stick with a hungry interest just as he warmed his subject. Just at this juncture, he was conscious of someone at his side, sure enough, and then a finger touched his arm. He looked up over his shoulder and saw an apparition a very allegory of hunger. It was a man six feet high, gaunt, unshaven, hung with rags, with a haggard face and sunken cheeks and eyes that pleaded piteously. This phantom said, 
Come with me, please. He locked his arm in bleachers and walked up the street to where the passengers were few and the light not strong, and then, facing about, put his hands in a beseeching way and said, Friend, stranger, look at me. Life is easy to you. You go about placid and content as I did once in my day. You have been in there and eaten your sumptuous supper and picked your teeth and hummed your tune and thought your pleasant thoughts and said to yourself, it is a good world, but you've never suffered. You don't know what trouble is. You don't know what misery is, nor hunger. Look at me, stranger, have pity on a poor friendless, homeless dog. As God is my judge, I have not tasted food for eight and 40 hours. Look in my eyes and see if I lie. Give me the least trifle in the world to keep me from starving. Anything, 25 cents. Do it, stranger. Do it, please. It will be nothing to you but life to me. Do it and I will go down on my knees and lick the dust before you. I will kiss your footprints. I will worship the very ground you walk on. Only 25 cents. I am famishing, perishing, starving by inches. For God's sake, don't desert me. Blucher was bewildered and touched too, stirred to the depths. He reflected, thought again. Then an idea struck him and he said, come with me. He took the outcast's arm, walked him down to Martin's restaurant, seated him at a marble table, placed the bill of fare before him and said, order what you want, friend. Charge it to me, Mr. Martin. All right, Mr. Blucher, said Martin. Then Blucher stepped back and leaned against the counter and watched the man stow away cargo after cargo of buckwheat cakes at 75 cents a plate, cup after cup of coffee, and porterhouse steaks worth $2 a piece. And when $6 and a half's worth of destruction had been accomplished and the stranger's hunger appeased, Blucher went down to French Pete's, bought a veal cutlet plain, a slice of bread, and three radishes with his dime, and set to and feasted like a king. Take the episode all around. It was as odd as any that can be called for the myriad curiosities of Californian life, perhaps. Chapter 60. By and by, an old friend of mine, a miner, came down from one of the decayed mining camps of Tuolumne, California, and I went back with him. We lived in a small cabin on a verdant hillside, and there were not five other cabins in view over the wide expanse of hill and forest. Yet a flourishing city of two or three thousand population had occupied this grassy dead solitude during the flush times of twelve or fifteen years before, and where our cabin stood had once been the heart of the teeming hive, the center of the city. When the mines gave out, the town fell into decay, and in a few years wholly disappeared. Streets, dwellings, shops, everything, and left no sign. The grassy slopes were as green and smooth and desolate of life as if they had never been disturbed. The mere handful of miners still remaining had seen the town spring up, spread, glow, sorry, grow and flourish in its pride, and they had seen it sicken and die and pass away like a dream. With it, their hopes had died and their zest of life. They had long ago resigned themselves to their exile and ceased to correspond with their distant friends or turn longing eyes toward their early homes. They had accepted banishment, forgotten the world and been forgotten of the world. They were far from telegraphs and, tel and railroads, and they stood, as it were, in a living grave, dead to the events that stirred the globe's great populations, dead to the common interests of men, isolated and outcast from brotherhood with their kind. It was the most singular and almost the most touching and melancholy exile that fancy can imagine. One of my associates in this locality for two or three months was a man who had had a university education, but now for 18 years he had decayed there by inches, a bearded, rough-clad, clay-stained miner, and at times, among his sighings and soliloquizings, he unconsciously interjected vaguely remembered Latin and Greek sentences. Dead and musty tongues meet vehicles for the thoughts of one whose dreams were all of the past, whose life was a failure, a tired man burdened with the present and indifferent to the future, a man without ties, hopes, interests, waiting for rest and the end. In that one little corner of California is found a species of mining which is seldom or never mentioned in print, 
It is called pocket mining, and I am not aware that any of it is done outside of that little corner. The gold is not evenly distributed through the surface dirt, as in ordinary placer mines, but is collected in little spots, and they are very wide apart and exceedingly hard to find. But when you do find one, you reap a rich and sudden harvest. There are not there are not now more than 20 pocket miners in that entire little region. I think I, excuse me, I think I know every one of them personally. I have known one of them to hunt patiently about the hillsides every day for eight months without finding gold enough to make a snuff box, his grocery bill running up relentlessly all the time, and then find a pocket and take out of it $2,000 in two dips of his shovel. I have known him to take out $3,000 in two hours and go and pay up every cent of his indebtedness then enter on a dazzling spree that finished the last of his treasure before the night was gone. And the next day he bought his groceries on credit as usual and shouldered his pan and shovel and went off to the hills hunting pockets again, happy and content. This is the most fascinating of all the different kinds of mining and furnishes a very handsome percentage of victims to the lunatic asylum. Pocket hunting is an ingenious process. You take a spade full of earth from the hillside and put it in a large tin pail and dissolve and wash it gradually away till nothing is left but a teaspoon, teaspoonful of fine sediment. Whatever gold was in that earth has remained because being the heaviest, it has sought the bottom. Among the sediment, you will find a half dozen yellow particles no bigger than pinheads. You are delighted. You move off to one side and wash another pan. If you find gold again, you move to one side further and wash a third pan. If you find no gold this time, you are delighted again because you know you are on the right scent. You lay an imaginary plan shaped like a fan with its handle up the hill. For just where the end of the handle is, you argue that the rich deposit lies hidden, whose vagrant grains of grain, excuse me, whose vagrant grains of gold have escaped and been washed down the hill, spreading farther and farther apart as they wandered. And so you proceed up the hill washing the earth and narrowing your lines every time the absence of gold in the pan shows that you are outside the spread of the fan. And at last, 20 yards up the hill, your lines have converged to a point, a single point, excuse me, a single foot from that point, you cannot find any gold. Your breath comes short and quick. You are feverish with excitement. The dinner bell may ring its clapper off. You pay no attention. Friends may die. Weddings transpire. Houses burn down. They are nothing to you. You sweat and dig and delve with a frantic interest, and all at once, you strike it. Up comes a spade full of earth and quartz that is all lovely with soiled lumps and leaves and sprays of gold. Sometimes that one spade full is all, $500. Sometimes the nest contains $10,000, and it takes you three or four days to get it all out. The pocket miners tell of one nest that yielded $60,000 and two men exhausted it in two weeks and then sold the ground for $10,000 to a party who never got $300 out of it afterwards. The hogs are good pocket miners. All the summer they root around the bushes and turn up the thousand little piles of dirt and then the miners long for the rains, for the rains beat upon these little piles and wash them down and expose the gold, possibly right over a pocket. Two pockets were found in this way by the same man in one day. One had $5,000 in it and the other $8,000. That man could appreciate it, for he hadn't had a cent in about a year. In Tuolumne lived two miners who used to go to the neighboring village in the afternoon and return every night with household supplies. Part of the distance they traversed a trail and nearly always sat down to rest on a great boulder that lay beside the past, by, beside the path. In the course of 13 years, they had worn that boulder tolerably smooth, sitting on it. By and by, two vagrant Mexicans come along and occupy the seat. They began to amuse themselves by chipping off flakes from the boulder with a sledgehammer. They examined one of these flakes and found it rich with gold. That boulder paid them $800 afterward. But the aggravating circumstance was that these greasers knew that there must be more gold where that boulder came from, and so they went panning up the hill and found what was probably the richest pocket that region has yet produced. It took three months to exhaust it, and it yielded $120,000. The two American miners who used to sit on the boulder are poor yet, and they take turn about in getting up early in the morning to curse those Mexicans, and when it comes down to pure ornamental cursing, the Native American is gifted above the sons of men. 
I have dwelt at some length upon this matter of pocket mining because it is a subject that is seldom referred to in print, and therefore I judged that it would have for the reader that interest which naturally attaches to novelty. And now chapter 61. One of my comrades there, another of those victims of 18 years of unrequited toil and blighted hopes, was one of the gentlest spirits that ever bore its patient cross in a weary exile, grave and simple Dick Baker, pocket miner of Dead House Gulch. He was 46, gray as a rat, earnest, thoughtful, slenderly educated, slouchily dressed, and clay-soiled, but his heart was finer metal than any gold his shovel ever brought to light, than any, indeed, that ever was mined or minted. Whenever he was out of luck and a little downhearted, he would fall to mourning over the loss of a wonderful cat he used to own. For where women and children are not, men of kindly impulses take up with pets, for they must love something. And he always spoke of the strange sagacity of that cat with the air of a man who believed in his secret heart that there was something human about it, maybe even supernatural. I heard him talking about this animal once. He said, gentlemen, I used to have a cat here by the name of Tom Quartz which you'd a took an interest in, I reckon. Most anybody would. I had him here eight year, and he was the remarkablest cat I ever see. He was a large gray one of the Tom species, and he had more hard natural sense than any man in this camp, and a power of dignity. He wouldn't let the governor of California be familiar with him. He never catched a rat in his life, appeared to be above it. He never cared for nothing but mining. He knowed more about mining that cat did than any man I ever, ever see. You couldn't tell him nothing about placer diggings. And, and as for pocket mining, why, he was just born for it. He would dig out after me and Jim when we went over the hills prospecting, and he would trot along behind us for as much as five mile if we went so far. And he had the best judgment about mining ground. Why, you never see anything like it. When we went to work, he'd scatter a glance around, and if he didn't think much of the indications, he would give a hook as to say, or give a look as much as to say, well, I'll have to get you to excuse me. And without another word, he'd heist his nose in the air and shove for home. But if the ground suited him, he would lay low and keep dark till the first pan was washed, and then he would sidle up and take a look. And if there was about six or seven grains of gold, he was satisfied. He didn't want no better prospect than that. And he would lay down on our coats and snore like a steamboat till we'd struck the pocket and then get up and superintend. He was nearly lightning on superintending. Well, by and by, up comes this year quartz excitement. Everybody was into it. Everybody was picking and blasting instead of shoveling dirt on the hillside. Everybody was putting down a shaft instead of scraping the surface. Nothing would do Jim, but we must tackle the ledges too. And so we did. We commenced putting down a shaft and Tom Quartz, he began to wonder what the dickens it was all about. He hadn't ever seen any mining like that before and he was all upset, as you may say. He couldn't come to a right understanding of it, no way. It was too many for him. He was down on it too, you bet you. He was down on it powerful and he always appeared to consider it the cussedest foolishness out. But that cat, you know, was always again newfangled at the arrangements. Somehow he never could abide him. You know how it is with old habits. But by and by Tom Quartz, but by and by Tom Quartz began to get sort of reconciled a little, though he never could altogether understand that eternal slinking of a shaft and sinking of a shaft and never panning out anything. At last he got to coming down in the shaft himself to try to cipher it out. And when he get the blues and feel kind of scruffy and aggravated and disgusted, knowing as he did that the bills was running up all the time and we weren't making a cent, he would curl up on a gunny sack in the corner and go to sleep. Well, one day when the shaft was down about eight foot, the rock got so hard that we had to put in a blast, the first blasting we'd ever done since Tom Quartz was born. And then we lit the fuse and climb out and got off about 50 yards and forgot and left Tom Quartz sound asleep on that gunny sack. In about a minute, we seen a puff of smoke bust up out of the hole, and then everything let go with an awful crash, and about four million tons of rock and dirt and smoke and splinters shot up about a mile and a half into the air, and by George, right in the dead center of it was old Tom Quartz, a going end over end, and a snorting and a sneering and a clawing and a reaching for things like all possessed. 
But it weren't no use, you know. It weren't no use. And that was the last we seen of him for about two minutes and a half. And then all of a sudden it began to rain rocks and rubbish, and directly he come down, cur whoop, about ten foot off and where we stood. Well, I reckon he was perhaps the orneriest, orneriest looking beast you ever see. One ear was sot back on his neck and his tail was stove up and his eye winkers was swinged off and he was all blacked up with powder and smoke and all sloppy with mud and slush from one end to the other. Well, sir, it weren't no use to try to apologize. We couldn't say a word. He took a sort of a disgusted look at himself and then he looked at us and it was just exactly the same as if he had said, gents, maybe you think it's smart to take advantage of a cat that ain't had no experience of quartz mining, but I think different. And then he turned on his heel and marched off home without ever saying another word. That was just his style. And maybe you won't believe it, but after that you never see a cat so prejudiced again court mining is what he was. And by and by, when he did get to going down in the shaft again, you'd have been astonished at his sagacity. The minute we'd touch off a blast and the fuse would begin to sizzle, he'd give a look as much as to say, well, I'll have to get you to excuse me. And it was surprising the way he'd shin out of that hole and go for a tree. Sagacity? It ain't no name for it. Twas inspiration. I said, well, Mr. Baker, his prejudice against quartz mining was remarkable considering how he came by it. Couldn't you ever cure him of it? Cure him? No. When Tom Quartz was sought once, he was always sought. And you might have blowed him up as much as three million times and you'd never have broken him of his cussed prejudice again quartz mining. The affection and the pride that lit up Baker's face when he delivered this tribute to the firmness of his humble friend of other days will always be a vivid memory with me. At the end of two months, we had never struck a pocket. We had panned up and down the hillsides till they looked plowed like a field. We could have put in a crop of grain then, but there would have been no way to get it to market. We got many good prospects, but when the gold gave out in the pan and we dug down, hoping and longing, we found only emptiness. The pocket that should have been there was as barren as our own. At last, we shouldered our pans and shovels and struck out over the hills to try new localities. We, pro we prospected around Angel's Camp in Calaveras County. Hmm? 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 during three weeks, but had no success. Then we wandered on foot among the mountains, sleeping under the trees at night, for the weather was mild, but still we remained as scentless as the last rose of summer. <laughs> that is a poor joke, but it is in pathetic harmony with the circumstances, since we were so poor ourselves. In accordance with the custom of this country, excuse me, in accordance with the custom of the country, our door had always stood open and our board welcomed to tramping miners. They drifted along nearly every day, dumped their post shovels by the threshold and took pot luck with us. And now on our own tramp, we never found cold hospitality. Our wanderings were wide and in many directions. And now I could give the reader a vivid description of the big trees and the marvels of the Yosemite. But what has this reader done to me that I should persecute him? I will deliver him into the hands of less conscientious tourists and take his blessing. Let me be charitable, though I fail in all virtues else. Some of the phrases in the above are mining technicalities purely and maybe a little obscure to the general reader. In placer diggings, the gold is scattered all through the surface dirt. In pocket diggings, it is concentrated in one little spot. In quartz, the gold is in a solid continuous vein of rock enclosed between distinct walls of some other kind of stone. And this is the most laborious and expensive of all the different kinds of mining. Prospecting is hunting for a placer. Indications are signs of its presence. Panning out refers to the washing process by which the grains of gold are separated from the dirt. A prospect is what one finds in the first pan full of dirt and its value determines whether it is a good or a bad prospect and whether it is worthwhile to tarry there or seek further. And on that little bit of vocabulary, I think we're done with today's reading. Thank you very much for joining me for our read aloud from Roughing It by Mark Twain. Um, we have just five more days of our book together it looks like a good chunk there, but actually there's quite a bit of appendices. So it's actually not that much more book that we have left to us. Oh, it just goes up to, it's just that little teeny tiny section. So um, we have just a bit over a hundred pages yet to go. So 
I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for more reading from Roughing It. And again, if you have not yet voted on what we should read next, please go ahead and vote. Um, and if you have already voted, go back and check and see if there's something new that's been nominated. And if there's still not a book there that you are super excited to read together, nominate the book that you'd be super excited to read together. All right. Thank you very much, friends. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow for more reading. Bye.